rather than make you wait, I'm just going to jump right in and get this thing started. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to the Walter Bosley channel. I see there are a bunch of folks already in the, uh, the live chat room. Welcome, all of you. I'm going to take uh, being early a couple of minutes. Oops, a couple of minutes to um, go through here. We have, we have old, I'm Inane Skira. I have no idea how to pronounce that old Skira. <laughs> we have Brian Evans from Wales. We have Leslie Patton. Is it, you know, usually two T's is Patton, but you're from Scotland. So is it Peyton? Or Patton, Peyton, I'm guessing Peyton, Leslie, right? All the way over there in Scotland, a place I have to get to because uh, the like the majority of my ancestry comes from there. Thank God, you know. Uh, let's see, Echo Cat 23, Rui Consalves is here. Johnny Side, hey, Johnny Side, of course, there's Malia. She's always with us. Brian, uh, did I already say Brian Evans? Yes, I did, but Brian Evans gets two two mentions. And um, Jack Pot is here. Uh, Crystal Fire. And, uh, oh, Old Skira is from Norway. Oh, that reminds me. I'm supposed to go on the, get myself scheduled on um, Foreign Borealis because we had to cancel or postpone, but... Uh, I need I need to let him know what date. And Ent Tropic Horizon is here. D Dorothy Papineau is here. The Juggler's assistant. Ari Babel is here. Hello, Ari. Martin Taylor. Um, I I think you guys need the um, the uh, hold on a second because I I'm I'm feeling it, baby. I'm feeling it, booby. I'm feeling it. Usually I save these for when Todd's on, but while I go through this, you get the um, Robert Evans movie producer. So, hey, babies, where are we? Yeah. So we're at Martin Taylor, Philip Blair. Hey, Philip Blair, booby. J. Cole. Uh, okay, I can't read with these things on. <laughs> anti, anti something from switzerland all right and okay you know what i want to pronounce that correctly instead of being a butthole host uh where'd you go antidotify from switzerland i have, have are you new here i haven't seen the, i think you're our first person from switzerland and we have don don fletcher and uh i said martin taylor nathan etzel right okay i'll make my and ao okay all right it is officially the top of the hour and we're here at the walter bosley channel and um i dropped something important out of there well sort of important i'll get it later we're here at the walter bosley channel for uh, probably well it's definitely one of my favorite topics that i've ever discussed since i've been doing this and um, I like to do these regularly, as you know. Our guest is, of course, our good friend, Dr. Joseph Farrell. I'm going to bring him in in a minute. I want to remind you all that this is our new time that we're going to be doing, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You guys do the calculations um, as to your time zones, but 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time is the new time. I'm liking this time. Uh, also, don't forget to go to WalterBosley.com to check out the NIMSACon and sign up for that. Um, our guest tonight is going to be one of the uh, two speakers that we have are going to be streamed in. You'll get to see him on a big screen if you attend um, the NIMSACon in Sonora, California, October 13th through the 15th. Don't miss out. There's going to be more specific details coming over the next couple of weeks. Also, um, don't forget at walterbosley.com, you can also get my upcoming book, Pre-Orders. It's uh, Pre-Orders are $5 uh, off what the sale retail sale price is going to be after it's released in September. Remember, September has 30 days, so don't expect it on September 1st, but in the month of September, it's going to be ready and released. But you, if you pre-order it at walterbosley.com, NIMSA, How America Sold Its Soul. And I mean that. I'm serious about it. We sold our soul, folks. Well, our government sold it on our behalf. Um, 
you can get it at 20 bucks in pre-order. So go to walterbosley.com on that. And uh, next week, of course, remember, uh, Tim Banal will return. He was here last night in a special episode. Tim Banal will return as the guest next week. So we're looking for that. So now, without further ado, I want to bring in our friend, Joseph Farrell. Hello, Joseph. Hey, Walter. What's going on? Oh, just, um, <laughs> you know, another another uh, uh, hot day in Southern California, but we're not having the relentless sunshine. We're having some overcast, and I do believe I felt a couple of raindrops on my arm when I was walking cool. in from the grocery store. So hopefully we get that. So you're uh, kind of calm right now there? Uh, I got to tell you, this has been absolutely, the, as anybody who's a member of my website knows, has been absolutely the worst year for weather. Yeah. Because normally, normally where I'm at, we have our spring, autumn, monsoon season, and then we either bake or freeze for a few months. <laughs> this year, the the storm season lasted until June when we had our big storm that knocked power out for me for three days, uh, took power out for about a third of the metropolitan area. And then for two weeks, we had, uh, as, as one weather report put it, 90% chance of steam. And... Um, we had a sauna for about two weeks. Now we're back to rain. So mm -hmm. beginning at three o'clock, every night this week at about three o'clock until five or six in the morning, we've had storms. Ugh. <laughs> so it's just, yeah, and don't I can't forget the big tree in my front yard. I had to have cut down. Did that hit your house? It actually, Walter, it came within about six inches. Oh. Wow. When, I, when I'd when i heard about the tree, I I, um, I thought, oh, no, did it hit the room with the organ? And then I remember where the tree is or was. Yeah. And I realized, okay, it could not have hit the organ. Oh, believe me, you would have heard weeping and gnashing of teeth <laughs> if, it, if it had hit the organ. Because, you know, Bruno Bruno is my connection to sanity. These days. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you. Just like, let's see, building model kits. Yeah, World of Warcraft. Uh, we yeah. all have our vices. <laughs> we, uh, all have, we all have our connections that keep us tethered. Yeah. So. <laughs> Particularly when, you know, the way things are. I'm going to, on my end here, make my screen bigger because it's, easy, you know, I prefer that. Um, as you guys know, I don't uh, <coughs> I don't look at the live stream during this portion of the show. Um, you have a new book out that uh, is absolutely pertinent to what we're discussing oh, wow. today. There it is. There Bef it is. Before we get to that, I've had somebody send me a message, you know, a, a viewer, whatever, asked me a, mm -hmm. a really good question. And I already told them um, that, oh, yes, indeed, uh, Dr. Farrell does keep a, a, a watch on this. They asked me about CERN. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked over the years and you talk about it, you know, in interviews and stuff about mm -hmm. CERN being in the mix of the Mandela effect and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. within that spirit, um, I thought today I would ask you off the top, um, do you think uh, among the more secretive, classified, discrete things they do at CERN, that it might have anything to do with either CERN uh, maybe monitoring or responding to the proposition I laid out a few months ago that really started the series, um, either monitoring or maybe part of a response to any kind of strikes from the ancient past through, say, the Giza Death Star to our present or wow. anywhere in that category. Uh, in other words, is, is CERN engaging in some sort of trans-temporal yes. operation? Well, yeah, yeah, but particularly uh, the second part of that would be particularly within this cosmic warfare context. Okay. Okay. I got you. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Now that I, I did not expect that question to start things off, but um, 
every every everything that I think about CERN is almost one hundred percent diametrically the opposite of the narrative that they're putting out. <laughs> okay, um, you know th they're telling us that this this gigantic contraption that they've built over there is for discovering uh, more and more fundamental particles in the ever growing pantheon of mm. of, <laughs> of particles in, in yeah. the quantum zoo. Uh, from the outset, I have been arguing that it's actually about uh, a peculiar kind of, of torsion physics and hyperdimensional physics. Right. And it's interesting to me, Walter, that after about three years, CERN finally came out and admitted that one of the things that they were looking for was precisely evidence or proof of higher dimensions. Now, once we say, this is the key that I want people to latch on to, mm -hmm. once we say higher dimensions, it follows almost inevitably, uh, especially if you look at the mathematical models that, that physics uses for such things, general relativity being the most familiar example, uh, once you say higher dimensions, you're immediately talking about time. Once you say torsion, you're immediately talking about time. So would CERN, to, to narrow the question somewhat, would CERN possibly be actively investigating such things or attempting to cause them? Um I think it's remotely possible, but here's the problem. And I think it'll become more evident once you start uh, reading your copy of the new book, what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. We are on the cusp, in my opinion, and, and we have been for quite some time. I, you know, this, this book, I, I've, I've wanted to write for 40 years. Wow. You know, I've had this thing in my noggin, but the problem was I couldn't write it because, well, quite frankly, I was a bit chicken and, and I wanted somebody else to take the dive off the deep end and put out, you know, so that all I had to do was, okay, here's my two cents. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So finally somebody did. <laughs> okay. Uh, otherwise, I would have been joining David Bohm, the famous physicist in the nuthouse. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, I think it's I think it's possible that CERN is part of the equipment driving a new physics. And let me let me cut right to the chase. Now that the new book is out, I can talk about it. what most people do not understand, Walter is that the physics that you and I know, that, that we were exposed to in elementary school through high school, mm -hmm. the physics of general relativity, of Kepler, of Galileo, of Copernicus, of Newton, of Einstein, of Tesla, to a certain extent, of Faraday, of Maxwell, by and large is the physics of solids, liquids, and gases, okay? 99% mm -hmm. of all matter in the universe is plasma. So what we've been doing is the physics of the 1%. Yeah, very little. Very little. So in other words, once you throw plasma into the mix... And once you really understand how truly bizarre <laughs> plasma physics really is, and I mm -hmm. mean totally bizarre, then the the doors are thrown open to all sorts of possibilities. Temporality is one of them. And mm -hmm. let me give you an example of what I mean. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this in the book. We are taught thanks to Einstein, that the speed of light is kind of an upper boundary limit, speed limit on any transfer of information faster than the speed of light being impossible. In other words, 
time travel is not possible. However, however, mm -hmm. as with so many things with Einstein, there are problems. <laughs> okay. Yes. Problem number one <laughs> is something called the Great Sloan Wall. Now, for those of you who do not know what the Great Sloan Wall is, it's a structure of plasma in space that is a coherent structure. And it is 137 billion, with a B, light years long. Now, the problem, therefore, is how does such a structure even cohere and hold itself together if information transfer is limited to the speed of light? That's problem number one. <laughs> okay. Now, once, uh, yeah, the light bulb just went off for Walter. <laughs> because I, the, I, the, the implication of that makes me smile. Yeah, because obviously... Obviously, this Einstein's structure, wrong. <laughs> well, that's a problem right there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yes, there there is something going on here that that is holding this. You know, think of a galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is about, you know, just a very rough figure off the top of my head, about four hundred and fifty thousand light years across, mm -hmm. and yet it's a stable structure that coheres yeah. and holds together. So the, the problem that plasma cosmology poses is it, it literally is taking the whole Einsteinian universe and shaking it says, this is nonsense. So do I think it's possible what you're saying, that CERN might be playing with these types of things? Well, yes, I do. Because if you're paying attention... There's all sorts of strange stuff that has been happening that that the standard physics cannot explain. Mm -hmm. Another example, and again, this is one that, that people are going to have to think about this one. We've all been taught that the sun outside our windows right now is a big chained up hydrogen bomb. Mm -hmm. And that it, you know, it's constantly blowing up and contracting under the sun's massive gravity, and voila, we have energy. <laughs> okay, yeah. and we have a steady stream of solar wind and particles and all of this crap flowing from the sun. And thank God that the Earth has a magnetic field, or we'd all be hot dogs. Okay, so that's the model. Except in May of 1999, something happened to the solar wind. It disappeared for two days. <laughs> now, the problem here is, folks, if it's a big chained up hydrogen bomb, you don't turn it off and then turn it back on. <laughs> no. That that's a problem. So yeah, do I think do I think transtemporal uh phenomena are possible? Yes, I do, because otherwise these gigantic structures would not exist. And, and, and that's if the key. and if the information yes that, that re required to for, for their existence yes. you're right if it has to travel faster than the speed of light what that means is that we as thinking beings can figure out how to harness what it harnesses right and that means Einstein's wrong and that means we will be able to travel faster than the speed of light. Which oh, I'm I'm an advocate of man space travel, so I love that kind of thing. Or or it means that there are structures that are are transtemporal, mm. and mm. that it is yeah. it is perhaps possible that by latching onto them that we would do that. Now, the 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 idea of of warfare at that point. Mm -hmm. Is, is made more intense because let's go back to, to what I said about the sun and that episode in 1999, which you know mystified the scientists that thought it was just a big chained up H-bomb, that the solar wind stopped for two days. <laughs> you know, 
it just yeah. quit. <laughs> All right. a, a natural force. A, a natural force just turned off. <laughs> okay. And yet, you know, the sun stayed there. We didn't suddenly plummet into a, a deep freeze. It didn't go supernova. You know, we're still here. So in other words, the big chained up hydrogen bomb model is not the primary physics of what's going on in the sun. What right. is the primary physics in the sun is it's a big ball of plasma. <laughs> okay. Right. And when you've said plasma, you've said what? You've said electromagnetism. Yes. And once you've said electromagnetism, you're saying that the the cosmos is primarily electromagnetic in its in its forces and functions, not gravitational. And once you've said that, then the sun becomes a tiny part of a big circuit. Structure. Yeah, circuit. Yeah, circuit. Right. Now, what's an atomic bomb? It's part of a circuit. It's okay. a big, it's a big, hot, glowing plasma. And when you set it off for a brief moment, I even put a picture in the book so that people could actually see what I'm talking about. You can see the electrical flow at the Trinity test at the moment that the fireball first initiates. In fact, I'm going to show you that picture just because it's so fun. Well, uh, uh, what I think is an astounding thought crossed my mind too okay see that bottom it. picture yes that's a negative view of the fireball of the trinity test in july of 1945 in new mexico look at okay. it for a moment yeah There's what is spikes it spikes on the bottom it's well it's got spikes on the bottom over here you see little lines going up from the ground it looks like a miniature sun it looks like a miniature cell cell Yes. Yeah, look at it. It's got internal structure. If yeah. you didn't know that was the fireball from the atom bomb test, you might think it was taken under a microscope. A single cell organism. A single cell organism. So what are these little pointy things and those things from the ground? Well, they're electrical streamers. They are currents that are initiated by the fireball so in other words the fireball is part of a larger circuit right there is what i've been saying for all of these years about hyperdimensional reactions being gated into nuclear reactions you're setting off a plasma inside a larger system of plasma so now yeah ding 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 and now I, now just stop and think about setting off one of those bombs in a much larger plasma. You're going inevitably to gate energy into the reaction from the larger plasma. Welcome to Cosmic Gunboat Diplomacy 101. Because you can just demonstrate that, right? right. We, we we can harness the sun, right, in these weapons, right. Right. Now here's the okay. problem. Yeah. <laughs> Many physicists, beginning with David Bohm, suspect that plasmas, or at least some of them, are alive. I was just going to ask you when you're showing that picture, ding, when, ding, when ding. You're, 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 you said it's like looking, I, I said it's like looking at an, uh, uh, a single cell organism under yes. a microscope. And what crossed my mind was at what point does it become sentient? Bingo. Now, what are plasmas? They or are sentient. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Well, we had a, a troll last well, night who bitched What are, what are plasmas? It. Plasmas are <laughs> aperiodic crystals. Yeah. What do crystals do? Well, they store information. Yes. Now, imagine a structure like the Great Sloan Wall, 137 billion <laughs> light years across. Mm -hmm. Imagine if that thing is sentient. It's not only very old, 
it's not only of immense extent, it yeah. would also be of extraordinary memory and intelligence. Welcome to the world of angels. <laughs> I was thinking maybe, yeah, I was thinking along the terms of God and things like that. And now let's go further. What happened at World War II? What suddenly starts showing up? UFOs. Foo Fighters, UFOs. Yeah. And when do they start showing up? After, well, after bombs are tested? After bombs are tested. And the Germans likely tested theirs. 44. 44, yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Now, when, when the bombs are tested, what are you doing? You're creating a plasma. So if plasmas are alive and they're a life form, what do they do? They investigate. Hey, who's playing around with us? Thus the secrecy over Roswell. Roswell might have been caused by us popping atomic weaponry off. Well, do you remember the space shuttle tether experiment, this Italian yeah. experiment that they were going to, you know, and I, Walter, this was such a nutty idea to begin with because anybody with a seventh grade education in basic physics could have told you this thing is going to short out. <laughs> Big time. So they're gonna un they're gonna unroll this this twenty mile long wire <laughs> from the space shuttle to see what happens. Well, <laughs> they unroll the damn thing, and naturally the electricity just zaps it in half, and off it goes. But remember what happened after that? Yeah, you saw all of these little blobs start coming in on the camera and following this tether looking at it. you saw a bunch of ball lightning for <laughs> for one yeah, better okay. expression following this tether what happens with crop circles ball lightning what yes what are yes. a lot of what are a lot of ufos ball light yes what does ball lightning do it goes through walls windows up and down chimneys uh, you know on and on we could go but my point is, if you start playing around with plasma, don't be surprised if some of it shows up and is not a little bit curious about yeah, what yeah, you're playing you know, around with. You, you, you just mentioned one of, one of my favorite, I think one of the most amusing human motivations throughout our existence is doing shit just to see what happens. Yeah, bingo. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, every scientist wants to wants to design something cool, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and go down in history. So, you know, here's the Germans playing with their damn bell, you know, yeah. counter rotating a plasma. Well, gee, you know, I wonder if there was some curiosity about that. Yeah, well, of course there was. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, the the point I'm trying to make here, Walter, is that. The plasma life hypothesis, mm -hmm. which I I absolutely think is is worth entertaining, mm -hmm. resolves a lot of problems, not only in in physics but just in terms of some of the um, areas of alternative investigation. That right. you know, the real question is why did why did some physicist David Bohm, you know, being the most classic example think that plasmas were alive i mean did you know did did this brilliant guy just suddenly lose his mind <laughs> you know did he read too many science fiction comic books um the 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 reason why was in his in his work for the manhattan project he was literally tasked with creating uranium plasma and it's very important that people understand what plasmas are. All of the protons of a uranium and neutrons of a uranium atom are there, and all the electrons of a uranium atom are there. It's just mm -hmm. that they don't exist in atoms. You're dealing with a non-atomic state of matter oh. that is still going to react chemically okay. the same way. But you're dealing with a giant cloud of, of ionized whatever, <laughs> okay? A thunderstorm. What's a thunderstorm? Well, it's it's a plasma. Uh, a nebula, right? A, ne is that, is yes, a nebula. Is a nebula? A nebula is a plasma. 
There's plasma between, here we go, folks, between the Earth and the Moon. And it's a cold plasma. Might want to might want to rethink setting off your hydrogen bombs in that area of the world, folks. <laughs> well, and 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 plasmas could be used as a means of surveillance. Yes, of course. If you um, if you if you knew how to do this, and and plasma, uh, I, I, because I have another question. So this is my question, maybe leading to it. Can plasmas? be used as an anchor through space and perhaps time that's what you're saying right yeah okay now it, what what came to my mind a few minutes ago when we were first going into this and and the time the transtemporal part of this discussion is it it dawned on my slow uh, simple you know uh, uh, mind that time itself could be used as a cloaking device Yes. Uh, in an attack. In other yes. words, another civilization could be coming at us right now in the past or the future and then Walter. click on our time, appear, strike, and then jump back in time Walter. and we don't see them. They've yeah. already done this. They have already created little micro events inside of time bubbles and removed those micro events from a time stream they've already you can go to fizz.org and look at the physics papers on this they've already oh. done it and by the way they will even use the term cloaking <laughs> wow. now mind you they've only done this on the micro quantum level but sure. my point is is that if you look at plasma physics unlike quantum mechanics and general relativity the physics of plasmas appears to be, here comes that all-important phrase, scale invariant. Oh. Plasmas exist in our light bulbs, and they exist on the scale of the Great Sloan Wall. And it's the same physics. So, in other words, the other thing that, that you need to remember about plasmas, and this is going to go back to what we talked about the last time we talked about, uh, mm -hmm. about my idea of, of time and events in time as being harmonic in nature. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is why I'm not a, a reincarnationist. I've never believed in the doctrine okay. because it ignores the possibility of history, not necessarily repeating, but at least rhyming. Okay. okay, and if it rhymes, it's a harmonic effect. Well, I've I've been leaning just real quick you know, on that. While you're on that, just quickly, um, I've been leaning more towards. I, I I'm deeply intrigued with what I call the Jack Finney and the Richard Matheson um, and remote viewing model, and that is huh. not so much a a traditional popular idea of reincarnation, but a a sending of your consciousness, your mind, your 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 identity. Um, into another time or into another body as opposed to a, a traditional reincarnation or am i sounding ignorant? no you're not sounding nutty at all <laughs> there um let me get back to that i want i want to concentrate on the harmonic aspect of this for a moment and i want to get to your book real quick here too so well the the what i'm what i'm trying to get at with the harmonics is that when you study plasmas, the other thing that you notice about them is they will set up membranes. This is uh -huh. why, again, this is why scientists are seriously considering that these things might be some sort of organism, a kind of inorganic life. Okay. Because they set up membranes between discrete regions inside of plasmas, just like living organisms have membranes between different organs. And these membranes are harmonic in nature okay when they respond to harmonics and once again we're dealing there therefore with some sort of, of crystal so they store information and you know I've, I've gone on and on as you know about crystals growing in response to the gravitational environment in which they're grown mm -hmm. and that response shows up in in the lattice defect of a particular crystal so plasmas as crystals also are histories of, of 
the electromagnetic space-time environment in which they're grown. So are they uh, temporal yes. in nature? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We just don't have we don't have the science that can tell us this particular history is part of this plasma because we're observing these kinds of defects. And you mentioned we're, that in a, in a past episode about yeah. the idea of if we could tap into that, that's how we could travel to. I yes. guess it would be a facsimile of that period of time, not right. that actual. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yeah. Right. That, you know what? Let's not get sidetracked with my okay. question. That I let's get to. Uh, le go ahead and lead all this into your book. Well, we're all waiting to hear about that. <laughs> well, the book is called "The Demon in the Acre." The subtitle is "Angels, Demons, Plasmas, Patristics, and Pyramids." Hmm. Uh, I. I cite extensively a, a very well-known church father and what he wrote about angels and what he wrote. I read this passage way back when I was in college mm -hmm. and it just flipped me out <laughs> because the guy, the guy was, um, if you read his language in a certain way, it sounds like a quantum physicist talking. Wow. Because it's it's all superpositional language to use the quantum physicist terms or uh, to use the theologians terms. It's all non dialectical and and non binary. <laughs> it's just you know he's talking about angels being bodiless and and immaterial mm -hmm. at and in the very next sentence he'll say they're they're kind of a less dense material. Well, okay, folks, if it's if it's a super fine matter, what else can we call it? We can call it the ether luminiferous of 19th century physics. Mm -hmm. um, so the the book is really about a, a an epigraph that I ran across when I way back when I was writing the original Giza Death Star, mm -hmm. and you know the story. I sent the original book to a publisher that was other than the publisher that ended up publishing it. Right. Yeah. Well, that original version of the book had an, you know me, I like epigraphs. At, at sure. the yeah, of my they're chapter. great. I love so, them. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's fun. But I yeah. had an epigraph that I included in the original version from Zechariah Sitchin talking mm -hmm. about the demon in the acre. That's the title of the book. It's about the epigraph. While I was waiting for the book to be either published or rejected by the publisher I originally sent it to, I kept crunching numbers. And the original publisher that I submitted it to rejected the book. And I thought, oh, well, good. I'm glad he did because now I can put in all these other numbers. And as yeah. I was doing that, I said, I was thinking, oh, I've got to take this epigraph out. I don't want to go there right now. Right. It would, you know, talking about angels and demons in the midst of all this other stuff, would just you know people would would lock me up in a rubber padded room and throw <laughs> away the key. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I I, just, I got rid of it. I restored it. I restored the epigraph in the Giza Death Star Revisited because mm -hmm. a fellow the the famous British thinker and author Robert Temple published mm -hmm. a book about the plasma life hypothesis called A New Science of Heaven. And I bought the book and I said, oh, finally, somebody's doing this. You know, You're not I so know, crazy anymore. <laughs> I, I'm not so crazy anymore. Yeah. Let Robert Temple take the fall for this. Yeah. <laughs> so I read the book and it's a very good book. But unfortunately, like most people, he's he's got to dress it up in his anti-Christian clothing and trot it out. Oh, here's another example of Gnosticism. And those bad Christians suppressed all this stuff. Well, bullshit. Right. You know, the reason I start this off with a lengthy citation from a famous church father is we've got the Gnostics beat up one side and down the other <laughs> uh, with with thought and thinking about this stuff. So, you know, take it and stuff it, Robert. But <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, I, I'm I'm doing the man an injustice. It's a very good book. It is well thought out and it is very well argued. All I'm doing in this book is, okay, having restored the Sitchin epigraph, I thought, okay, originally I was going to write it, write this book as a webinar on my website to show people this is what I've been talking about all this time. 
Whenever I've been talking about hyperdimensional physics and nuclear reactions, this is what I'm talking about. Whenever I was writing The Cosmic War, the book, and spent all of that time with plasma physics, this is why. When I'm talking about Tesla and his Colorado experiments, what's the mm -hmm. relationship to plasma physics? This is the relationship. What's the okay. relationship to 19th century physics of the ether? This is the relationship. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. This, this is a hugely unifying thesis. And the thing that unifies it, oddly enough, is the hypothesis that these things not only might be alive, they might actually be what, you know, what uh, the Gnostics and the Greco-Romans and the Vedas and, you know, all of these different traditions were calling the gods or that the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians are calling angels and demons, whatever. Right. Uh, because essentially you're dealing with bodiless life forms that also can, on certain occasions, exhibit uh, behaviors that seem like they're, they're intelligent. Think of the way that ball lightning sometimes behave, or those strange little things that appear on the NASA uh, tether videos that appear like they're investigating this tether. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on here? Well, it's obvious if you look at it a certain way that you're dealing with something that has some sort of intelligence and is curious. Uh, and, you know, being electromagnetic phenomena, can they invest an organic life form like us? Yeah. Can they screw up our thinking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're electromagnetic. Sure they can. And, but, and, and the other way around is, us doing these experiments, us toying with, for instance, the, uh, you know, our atomic tests Bingo. might have been the thing that destroyed the dinosaurs thousands, millions of years ago. Yeah. If and you talk the effects across time sure. and space. Sure. We, we might have made the dinosaurs, so to speak, you know, the extinction event. We might have caused that in our times. Wow. Do, do, do ripples and plasmas flow forward and backward well yeah if you're if you're creating a structure the size of the sloan wall mm -hmm. any any waveform is going to travel in all of those dimensions i'm going to show you some pictures here from the book okay i hope it, i hope everybody can see that see that picture yeah right here it looks like the inside of an eyeball actually that's cosmic filament those are plasmas that are scattered all through the universe. Look at, look at, look at this picture. There we go. Yeah. Wow. More cosmic plasma. Space is full of it. Now look at that picture over here. Ah, they're congealing at certain points. No, actually, that's a picture of the neurons and synapses inside of a human brain. Oh. That's interesting. Okay. In other words, in other words... Look what else it does. It suggests that there's actually a neurophysiological structure to the cosmos itself. Yeah. 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 We, we are the stardust. Idea. We are the stardust. Our individual brains have similar structures to this immensely gigantic structure. The metaphor is coming to mind. The metaphor is coming to mind. Yeah. All of those ancient doctrines about man being a microcosm. Cosm. Yeah, yeah. All of those patristic Christian doctrines that people <laughs> like to make fun of so much mm. in their theological ignorance about the universe being a Mac Anthropos, a large man are coming right. home to squat. Oh. So in other words, this plasma life hypothesis, folks, has implications that don't stop. If you're going to play around with the stuff, you might be inviting down, as I've said many times, you might be inviting down high heaven on your heads. Or hell.
or hell, so to speak, so to speak, which puts the current congressional hearings that you talked about last night mm -hmm. into a whole new cocked hat because yeah. we might not be dealing with nuts and bolts technology. You might very well be dealing with genuinely hyperdimensional bodiless powers. So in that sense, uh, with all joking aside, we might indeed have witnessed a tiny disclosure. Ding, ding, ding. But they don't want to go there. Remember right. what I said way back? You and I were at the San Mateo Secret Space Program. Yes. Conference. Yeah. All right. And do you remember what I said in my initial lecture? I said that if you were the national security state in July of 1947, that date yeah. that Senator McCarthy just happened to mention off the top of his head yep. in his hearings, if you were the national security state in July of 1947, yep. and you're, you're thinking about this UFO problem, this means you've got a huge problem. You've got Nazis out there. You've got the Soviet communist bloc, and then you've got UFOs. And how are you going to deal with all of it? And right. if you're thinking a certain way about the UFO and yeah. suspecting that these things are some form of plasma, you might be thinking, uh-oh, we're in for another potential Tower of Babel moment from these things, and we have to show them that we have the ability to weaponize things on their level. And you mentioned McCarthy, and you've mentioned before, he didn't get in real trouble until he got too close to the U.S. Army technology involving UFOs. Yeah, folks, bingo. Yeah, read, absolutely. Start, start with this book, folks, seriously. Start mm -hmm. with this book. Yeah. And, then, and then go to Joseph's books. Yeah. Notice I've got them handy. <laughs> yeah, McCarthy didn't get into trouble until he started probing around the UFO stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and and it could be that that's because of what we talked about was learned right through the atomic research. Right. Well, and and precisely, and this this is my point. Uh, you're dealing with with a with the plasma life hypothesis. You're dealing with something that has such sweeping implications. So. If if you suddenly think that you've you've called these entities attention to this tiny little planet on the edge of of this galaxy, mm -hmm. and that these things are truly cosmic in their power, how do you how do you ward them off? Well, in other words, you're playing gunboat diplomacy now, not just on the Kardashev. Uh, civilization scale of, of a class one or class two civilization, you're playing around with class three. Hmm. How do you how do you ward off a a bunch of entities that have truly galactic scale and power and intelligence? How do you do that? Well you do it through plasma. Yeah through, through the, the very science that you've tapped into. Through the yeah. very science that you've tapped into. So in other words, folks, what I'm telling you is that cosmic war didn't end millions of years ago. We're back in it. As and maybe it never ended. Maybe we've and been maybe in it, it all along. Ended. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that so all this is what brought the demon to the Eckhart. Yeah. Well, precisely. Sitchin, Sitchin cites in his book *The Wars of Gods and Men*, which to me is one of the one of the most uh, significant books ever written, because it's the the weapon hypothesis of the Great Pyramid, folks. It's not mine. It's Zechariah Sitchin's, and he advanced it in that book. The demon in the acre is coming from a a an Akkadian text called uh, the Ludlow Bel, uh, Bel Nimeki, pardon me. And he cites a little passage from this old Akkadian text that refers to the demon in the acre. 
Aker is, as I pointed out in my book, The Cosmic War. These books are all kind of stitched together. Mm -hmm. uh, Aker is, is an Akkadian term that means mountain. But it's also a term that they will use to mean a ziggurat or a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And they will also use it on rare occasions in reference to planets. Okay. Okay. So in other words, the demon in the acre is literally a demon associated with a pyramid. Now, if there's one pyramid in particular that cries out for some sort of demonic association, in my opinion, it's the Great Pyramid. And indeed, Sitchin in his book argues that all of these gods are fighting over and by means of the Great Pyramid. So in other words, he's associating in his own mind and in his own reasoning processes, he's associating demons with the Great Pyramid. All I'm doing is putting the frosting on the cake in this book mm -hmm. by saying, okay, how do we explain that? Well, as I argued in, in the Giza Death Star series and then in, in the new fourth uh, revision book, Chris Dunn has the idea that inside the Great Pyramid there was a hydrogen gas. Mm -hmm. Well, I went a little further, as you recall, in my books and argued maybe that hydrogen existed in an endothermic plasma state mm -hmm. and maybe it was in a state of plasma pinch. And once we've said plasma pinch, once we've said plasma, we're in the realm now of plasma life hypothesis. Uh, so, okay. in other words, I'm saying that Chris Dunn's own argument is suggesting that by putting a plasma inside a pyramid, you're you're basically saying that the pyramid is a, a habitation, basically for a life form that's but, bodiless and intelligent. This could I could see this application making the Star Trek transporters a real thing. Ding ding ding! Yes, absolutely. You you create that you you have a contained area. You create the 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 plasmatic right. uh, environment, and then through time, space, or whatever, you trans literally literally transport people and objects. Yeah. Why? Because wow. because plasmas are not in an atomic form. Yeah. It's all the particles are there, but but they're not arranged into atoms. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> You know, as I said, they are truly strange. They are truly very, very strange. And 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 this, I mean, when you went with the th think about these, uh, somebody has thought of like plasma rifles, for instance, on a battlefield. Yes. You're shooting other soldiers. Okay, this is a crazy. This is I'm a writer. I also write fiction, so I think like this. Uh, you shoot a soldier in a in a battlefield with a plasma rifle, and his grandchildren are affected by the wound. Oh, could be, yes. Through time and space, plasmatically. Sure. I, I mean, that, that kind of idea comes to my mind, well, and that again, just makes it all insane. Again, what are we? Well, DNA is an aperiodic crystal. So right there in DNA, you have a resemblance to plasma, which is also an aperiodic crystal. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the idea of a genetic memory is tied to this idea of a crystal and to the lattice structure of a crystal mm -hmm. because crystals are are responding to the environment in which they're grown. In other words, they are a literal record or memory of that environment. Now take something like the Great Sloan Wall. You know, mm -hmm. this thing is... I worked it out in the book. I tried to calculate what 137 billion light years is. It's something like 913, something like that, septillion miles. <laughs> you know? It's gigantic. So, and it, it, it's it's just um, it's it's a thesis that has implications that spin out everywhere. I mean, they, Walter, they don't stop. And if there is a, a, a physics basis to this idea of a transtemporal war mm -hmm. or memory or even the idea that oh, I have this memory of having lived another life, I think it's going to be coming from these types of phenomena. 
Yeah, I see, I, 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 I see the. I, I'm understanding the logic of that, and and that could explain a lot. It could explain the the human deja vu experience. It could right. explain where the concept of reincarnation comes right, from. Comes from, and you know, while we're on the idea of 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 that type of esotericism, you know, there's the idea of the astral body or the bardo body, or right. in Saint Paul, the spiritual body. You know, there's all these. All these different terms, I think, for a similar underlying phenomenon. Well, I, I think of also what comes to mind in this is the Star Trek pilot episode, the classic, The Menagerie. And remember, yes. they keep Christopher Pike happy in the end by they, they let him go live in, a, in, in when he's younger and before he's injured. And he's off living in this this place, you know, for all eternity. Uh, technically, that could be in some type of, of uh, plasma container what reality that i was just getting there because every every biological body this is what came out during covid remember how mm -hmm. they how they used this during covid with the six feet social distancing why did they say that it's because every one of us has this biological cloud kind of a dust cloud around us around our bodies like pig pen and charlie brown like pig right. pen and charlie brown that extends about six feet and it's yeah. a it's a bioplasma in wow. other words it's it's a kind of immaterial part of our okay. body another me, emission we excrete we let me you know. let me repeat what i just said is a kind of immaterial part of our body Ooh. because it's that super fine plasma matter Oh, wow. So in other words, I've been telling people this for years, Walter. We are not souls imprisoned in a body. The We're aura. bodies inside of a soul. The, 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 the aura. Aura. Curly and photography. The bardo body. The spiritual body. What ha whatever you want to call it, it looks like. We're just getting to the point now in biophysics of being able to look at these old doctrines and say there is something possibly that has a physics basis to all of these old doctrines. Now, once we've said that, then where is consciousness? Is it locked up inside of this? Or is it non-local? I it's, suspect it's non-local. Yeah. yeah, it's it's. This is what this is suggesting. Yep. And, I, and then when and then when you talk about that, I think too of go back to the tether experiment Bingo. Um, and the things that were coming that were curious. Yeah, c could curious um, uh, uh, sentient, however you pronounce that, right? Um, could other beings on this level? you know, this aura, let's call it, that, that yeah. we have attached to us. And sure. there's another concept in scriptures and such about demonic entities Possession. attaching themselves to us. Yeah, Possession. well, look, oh, look at the crap. Old Testament, Balaam's ass. All of a sudden, you've got a donkey out there, and it starts to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, how... Oh. Did how does that happen? What what is demonic Well, the donkey be, was a politician. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably, yes. <laughs> I I won't mention which party I think they're from, but the, the donkeys, well, the, the donkeys big clue. Are the clue, folks. They, yeah, they give us a big clue. <laughs> yeah, there's a big clue there. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a lot of phenomena, demonic possession, astral bodies, you know, all of this stuff that that this plasma life hypothesis at least initially looks like mm -hmm. it you know as a, as i said at the outset this is the, this is the 99 percent of all matter in the universe and we've only started studying it in real detail in the last century so we're starting late here folks um and we've got a long way to go am i saying all plasmas are alive no am i saying all living plasmas are intelligent no we simply don't know but we've got to be open to the possibility that yeah some of them may be alive 
And quite a few of them do act as if they're exhibiting some sort of intelligence and we better tread carefully. Or other living things could latch on to plasmas and travel across space through time with this yeah. on this network that you're talking about. This circuit, Precisely. This circuit the circuit. Yeah. Space. I mean, look at look at that cosmic filamentary picture of all of those plasma filaments in the cosmos. Yeah. In other words, those filaments are electromagnetic currents of electricity, folks. And the fact that you have such a vast, universally extended fabric of those kinds of connections and the fact that they resemble neurons and synapses ought to tell you something. Yeah. You know, we cosmological physics may turn out to be biophysics. Yeah. And I, I personally think that's given given the ancient doctrines of man as a microcosm or the universe as a, as a large man, uh, given all of these ancient doctrines, it's looking increasingly to me that that's very likely. Not the least, remember, I've also written in my books, folks, about the anthro anthropic cosmological principle that physicists have noticed, that if you change just a few of the constants of physics, life would be impossible. And some physicists think that if you if you really dig down into the implications of, of these physical constants, what they're telling you is that the universe was created for intelligent life to emerge and observe it. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, I don't care what you say. That's a theological proposition, like it or not. And it's been, it has been said in the Vedas, in the I Ching, in in the Tao, in, in Buddhism, you know, virtually every philosophical or religious system on earth has said that this is not an accident. Because these are the first, the theologians, yeah. the spiritual thinkers, they were the first people to think, to consider these concepts. Right. And to try to put them in some type of words and in, in concept. Well, you've heard me talk many times, Walter, about Neoplatonism, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Greek philosophy. Well, one of the things in, in the Neoplatonic cosmology that falls out of it is that the universe is literally teeming with life. In other words, that this whole, this whole system that, that Plotinus and his followers construct is really saying that everything in the universe is, is alive. Well, if you look at the plasma cosmology and the plasma life hypothesis, that's one implication that it would seem to explain why these ancient systems like the Egyptians or the Neoplatonists viewed the universe more as, as organism than mechanism. You know, and I've been I've been beating that drum for so long it's yeah. not even funny because I, I I'm just not satisfied with this Victorian 19th century British Empire vision of yeah. of, of thing as Ooh. as a gig yeah as yeah, yeah. as a gigantic not, machine. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that either. And 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 what they did to science in the public perception of science after 1830 with the change in the Royal Society. Oh, you know, absolutely. The, the materialist bean counters. Absolutely. Control ding, of everything. Ding, and, ding. I mean, and, you know, it was a steampunk universe, Walter. That they, you know, everything was steam. <laughs> now, um, so what, and if, if, if possible, if you can, uh, uh, who, what and who is the demon in the egg or if you had to the the interesting thing here is this this gets even more interesting because the demon the, the demon could either be the, the just the the concept of the, the the thing and it's dangerous or it can have an identity but go ahead i didn't mean to interrupt well i think it has an identity mm. and i imply it very strongly in the book in the in the akkadian text that sitchin cites the ludlow bell namaki Mm -hmm. which is actually a very interesting text to read. It reads like a psalm. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly about, you know, the sufferings of the righteous. Yeah. But there are these odd little references in the text that pop up <laughs> every now and then. And one of them is the demon in the acre, which turns out, by the way, mm -hmm. to be a she demon. The demon is female. Feminine. Right. Yeah. You, you mentioned that in, the I think, the last talk we had. Yeah. Which, you know, just kind of blew my mind. 
Because, well, first of all, you're implying, you know, if you if you connect this to the plasma life hypothesis, you're implying that that these things have some sort of sexuality. Uh, you know, how that works, <laughs> I have no idea. But in addition to, to the femininity of, of this demon in the acre, and apparently she's a real bitch, if you'll pardon my expression. <laughs> <laughs> But, but uh, she's not a nice person, folks. Oh. So, so don't go out looking for her. But, but anyway, um, if you if you look at Sitchin's implication that this this demon in the acre is a demon attached to the Great Pyramid, mm -hmm. to me, what Sitchin seems to be attempting to say he's coming up to the precipice but he doesn't want to push you over it so i think what sitchin's trying to say is that the demon here is lucifer why well first of all look where the pyramid is located okay. it's located at what many people think was the exact ancient prime meridian of the earth Okay, yeah. It was located also at the more or less exact center of the surface land mass of the planet. Okay. It's located also at the exact point where the Nile Delta fans out into right. the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, it's located at the perfect place where you would erect a planetary governmental center okay and what's lucifer in the bible he's the angel given charge of the governance of the earth where where, where does the it's a it's a she come in are we talking about a cosmic level androgyny yeah yeah in this the, being the, the she the she is coming in from uh the akkadian text okay Sitchin and and my own attempt to kind of reconstruct what he's implying here and what the texts of of the Old Testament seem to be implying about Lucifer, Lucifer's governance of the planet is genuinely suggested in the Old Testament. He's he's in other words the he's the planetary guardian angel. Uh, this is this is the thing that people seem to forget is that the planets themselves in in this ancient lore have their own appointed guardian angels, as do incidentally all the nations or peoples of the earth. There are special angels appointed to guard China or Russia and so on and so forth. So there's a planetary angel that would be Lucifer who was set up as the governor of the earth and then of course fell so if you wonder why the planet screwed up that's why but my point is is if you're going to erect a a house of government mm -hmm. and a structure that so to speak transduces you and gives you the power of governance over that planet where would you put it well you'd put it exactly there yeah now, as for Lucifer, if if all of this is summing together to make one comprehensive picture, and I'm not suggesting it is, although I lean that way myself, it would suggest that Lucifer is a feminine creature mm -hmm. rather than a masculine one. Okay. Which to me is very interesting because this would seem to fit the lore of the planet Venus, which is also the bright morning star and associated therefore with Lucifer. Oh, that makes sense of some things that otherwise. Oh, don't. I know it did. That's why <laughs> oh, I tossed oh. it out. That's why I tossed it out there, Walter. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 And why does Lucifer target Eve in yeah. the garden as the point at which to introduce the fall? Why not Adam? Yeah. Why Eve? Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot going on in all these old texts with with you know their multi-layered symbolism. 
uh, that that's going on here that, you know, we in our modernist rush to say, oh, this is all metaphor. It's not true. You know, <laughs> we're throwing out the baby with the bath. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's there's a lot going on here with the symbolism behind Lucifer. And I think the association mm -hmm. with Venus and, and I mean, look at Venus. It's a hothouse planet. Yeah. You know. Well, as you were saying, I think um, I was watching your recent discussion with uh, Daniel List, dark journalist. Mm -hmm. You were talking about, you know, uh, because of the way it, it spins its or lack of spin, whatever, it um, uh, ice cold on one side, yeah, blazing hot on the other, and there's that liminal zone that you mentioned. Yes, yeah. Uh, that was, uh, I think we were talking about Mercury. Mercury, I'm sorry, yeah. But, yeah. you know. The, My bad. The fig I even mentioned in the book that, that in Dante's Inferno, Lucifer is at the apex of a pyramid because you've got his vision of hell as this inverted pyramid or yes. cone mm -hmm. that goes down. And at the very center and bottom of that cone, which if you invert it would be at the apex, mm -hmm. is Lucifer frozen in ice, beating his wings furiously to get out of it. And of mm -hmm. course, it can't. Right. So yeah, there's there's all this very weird association of of demons and pyramids. What's what's another famous association? Well, Mexico. Quetzalcoatl absolutely forbids human sacrifice. What happens in Mexico? You have sacrifice and demons associated with pyramids. Oh yeah. In in complete contradiction. To their own creation myth and the commandment given so it's you know it's it's very weird that all of these symbols seem to possess such a uniform character around the world add the plasma life hypothesis to it and i think you've got the basis for why most of these traditions have an idea that that these gods or angels or whatever have the ability not only to be bodiless and of great extension, but also to shape shift because they can take on material form and so on and so forth. They can go through solid objects and so on. They can possess animals or people. And so if you were, if you were in the um, uh, uh, newly formed or if you were in the post-World War II War Department in the United States, for example, yep. and you've got these Nazi scientists telling you, uh, we messed around with our plasma thing, the bell, and we opened up gateways, <laughs> and you guys opened up portals with the atomic stuff, yep. you know, like we did. Um, this is what you're dealing with. They could, be, yep. they could have been faced with, um, the idea is this threat narrative. It yep. might not have so much to do with uh, traditional outer space, other planets, other stars, it could have to do with other dimensional stuff that's yeah. stuff plasma stuff that, that that's, can that's that right can there. come in and hit us and then cloak itself in the past or yeah. the future. Yeah. Um yeah. yeah. Which which means which puts <coughs> cosmic war really within a, a, a new comprehensive definition and a potentially um, existential yes. horror. Yes, the cosmic war was cosmic. Uh, I mean, Mars. <laughs> what? What? The the ruins that I think they're leaking out to us and you know, kind of teasing us with on Mars. That, for all we know, the the, the strike that did that could have been during the days of Percival Lowell. Sure. And, you know, they could have been seeing that. And so then by the time we start sending stuff there a hundred years later, well, Walter, it, don't it forget, looks ancient and old. Don't forget. Schla uh, Schla oh, I can never remember that. that Russian Schleiman? No, oh, no, uh, no. Schla Schlotzville or that, that Russian astronomer that Sagan translated. That, oh yeah. That was the one that pointed out that why did it take us so dang long to discover Phobos and Deimos? Right. Right. The, the yeah, telescope because... technology existed in Newton's day. So yeah, why John, they... and then there's the whole Jonathan Swift question. Swan, Jonathan Swift, yes, that, that yeah. whole little problem. <laughs> so you know what happened there? Did someone yeah. park those moons there? Or right. you know, I... well, I think our moon was parked. Oh, I, 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 I'm... I'm in total agreement with you. <laughs> there's no other way to explain the physics of what it's doing other than someone parked it there.
the right now there's i'm sure there's materialists in our in the in the maybe the live chat certainly the audience and their heads are spinning no don't even go there how can you guys say this you know, i can crazy. say it because the physics of of capture or fishing from the Pacific Basin yeah. does not work to produce what it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> it can't happen. So, <laughs> well, um, I think it's time we probably went go go to the live chat for questions. You got time for questions? Oh, still? I've got gobs of time. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Um, and I'm uh, not in a hurry. Yeah, folks, we're not. We're we're probably going to go beyond my usual ninety minute thing, so um, we don't have to squeeze questions in in the next ten minutes. So let me um, <laughs> let me because the chat room said cosmic tow truck on its way. <laughs> So, um, cause we can continue going and we will the next time around, we'll continue with letting, you know, pulling the thread. So remember everybody, all caps, if you want me to see it so that, um, Joseph can acknowledge it, or we can answer the question or whatever, all caps. And we have Philip Blair asking <coughs> what's a good working definition for demon and, or for angel in this oh, context. Good question. Um, I would say a an immaterial entity living intelligent entity and by immaterial what i'm what i'm not attempting to suggest you'll have to read read the book and read that lengthy passage from from the particular church father that i quote but by immaterial i mean simply a a a form of matter that is so fine it might as well be the thing next pardon me next to vacuum it's that immaterial, okay? And it's in a plasma state. In other words, it's not arranged into atoms and molecules. <laughs> it's, it's arranged into regions with membranes that are easily definable once you know a few things about plasma physics, light and frost layers, uh, dual charge layers, and so on. Um, in addition to the... To the physical aspect or the immaterial aspect, I would also say that depending on what you're dealing with, they are of great spatial temporal extent. And the difference between a demon and an angel would be the intention of will accompanying them. Now, this is a very important point to whoever asked the question, Philip Blair. Philip Blair. Yeah. Uh, that intention of will is one of the interesting things that it appears to me locates them. And I use an example, Philip, in the book that if you if you can envision yourself standing with one foot in one room, you're in a doorway. And you've got one foot in one room and another foot in another room. Which room are you in? Well, you're in both rooms. Mm -hmm. But now add intention to it. You've got one foot here and another foot there. But your mind is focused on yet somewhere else. And where your mind or will is focused is where you are. Well, with, with these beings... That that focus of the will is extreme because it's that focus of the will that, so to speak, locates them. So they may be spread across the universe, but they may be staring at you. And that focus of will and therefore all the power that goes with it is directed at one particular spot at one particular thing. And there's actually a quotation from this church father that suggests this, and it suggests it in language, folks, that cannot be in, understood as anything less than quantum mechanical. I, I don't know how else to put it. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, there's the intention of the will is what defines the, the difference between angels and demons. One is good, the other is evil. Very good question. Very good. Red Cap Goblin asks, what's the best way to trick humanity in responding to a fake alien threat? I guess within our context, yeah, I 
I can think of already ways that we could do that. Oh yeah, I I can think of you know I can think of of several things too. But one way you would do it is to fake crashes and retrievals and dead alien bodies. Yeah. Remember, these things can shape shift. Yeah. Uh, so just leave just leave a little debris around. They can look like whatever you want them to. Yeah, they can look like whatever you want them to. Uh, uh, take note, ET hypothesis people. Yeah, take note. Yeah, and and the other problem is I think that we forget that in all of of ancient lore, you have this phenomenon of possession. In other words, you can literally be literally be mind manipulated by these entities into a massive deception and into whole belief systems, so to speak, mm -hmm. that are cobbled together quite literally out of thin air. You know, and I have to wonder, quite frankly, uh, Red Cap Goblin, if um, with the insanity that we're seeing abroad in the world right now, particularly in the political leadership class, uh, not only of, of this weekend at Bernie's uh, misadministration, to borrow Walter's observation that I just love from last night, <laughs> because that's exactly the way it strikes me oh, too, yeah. Walter. They're just dragging... <laughs> Bernie around everywhere. Well, yeah, there. You know, it's it's that <laughs> it's that scene where they're dragging his corpse on the speedboat yeah. behind them, and he he's hitting all these buoys in the harbor with a clang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. But yeah, I I think that's I think it's possible that we're looking at deception and mind manipulation on that scale yeah. on the planet. That you know, a lot of these people are acting completely irrational. To me, they're acting possessed. I'll be quite frank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, now uh, Jim Gerard asks: Is the Mandela effect attributable to, attributable to something other than the Hadron Collider? Oh yeah, I think so. Absolutely, I do. I, I um, Jim, my 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 hypothesis basically is that the the Hadron Collider might be involved in a, a much larger macrophysics experiment because the Hadron Collider has a worldwide internet presence that if you wanted to monitor a social experiment on a global scale, the Hadron Collider would inevitably be involved simply because of that presence on the internet. So what do I mean by a, a an experiment of, of that nature? What I have suggested, Jim, is that the problem with quantum mechanics and, and the observer effect in quantum mechanics, which comes from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, is that this effect in quantum mechanics is restricted to the very, very small particle physics and the effect comes out of heisenberg's observation that you cannot measure the position and momentum of an electron at one and the same time so you predetermine the result of the experiment depending on what you are looking for prior to even performing the experiment what are you going to measure in other words what i'm proposing happened is as soon as Heisenberg proposed that, many scientists began to wonder then, if that's the case, at what point does the observer effect stop or does it have an effect at the macrocosmic scale of the physics of the very large? And if so, can that effect be tweaked by having group observers perform it? And mm. if a group observer can perform it, what are the limits to its effect on the macro scale? So what would you do in order to test that hypothesis? You would test it by planting evidence in, or, or a story in the consciousness of a group of people at the same time to see what effect it would have 
in the macroverse? Would it have an effect? For example, you plant the story that Nelson Mandela died in prison in South Africa during the period of his arrest and imprisonment. That's where the Mandela effect comes from. People remember Nelson Mandela having died in prison. Now, as a result of that, did that alter their perception of reality sufficiently to be able to alter reality itself? In other words, did their subsequent decisions change as a group the timeline? Did it manifest in an observable effect in the macroverse? Now, I suspect that what they've been doing is running stories like this mm -hmm. to see if there has been or if they can create a macro effect in the universe. What I suspect they've done, if that's true, is they've created a kind of physical, spatial weak spot at certain points in our universe where things are not as stable. If you've ever seen the TV uh, series Fringe, they go into this idea uh, in that series very much so. Uh, I suspect something like that would happen. Now, the reason I suggest that this is the effect that, that has been caused is that there are these persistent stories, if you know where to look in the literature, mm -hmm. of people that appear or disappear, and when they appear, particularly, there's a story, a famous story of a man that appeared going through customs in Japan with money and a passport from a country that didn't exist in Europe. And the Japanese did not know what to do, so they put this guy up in a hotel to try and figure out what to do, and then the next day they, they bring the man out, and they discover the man is gone, just mm. gone. <laughs> so, you know, things like this have happened. Timelines appear to have bled over into yeah. each other. Yeah. Um, is that possible? Yeah, I think possibly it is. Balkan Secrets asks, uh, who were the parties involved in the cosmic war? If we if we had to guess, if you had to guess, Joseph. Well, I've always approached this from the standpoint that that this is the war between Lucifer and Michael. Uh, that, in other words, that that this, or if you prefer, the gigantomachy from from Greek mythology. You know, pick yeah, your yeah. Cos who, pick who, your cosmic world. Whoever and whatever Lucifer and Michael are in the yeah. objective reality right. out there, right? It's it's that war that we've been told about within that context, it's right? That context. Yeah, you know, there are different versions of this war all over the world, but basically, it's a war between good and evil on a cosmic scale, and the parties always involve mankind. And the reason that they involve mankind is that mankind is the common surface. He is the creature standing in the doorway with one foot planted in the physical universe and another foot planted in the immaterial universe. He's the common surface that binds the two together. So if you are a particularly malevolent individual and you want to destroy that whole thing, you hit it at that connecting link. That's why I've said mankind is the battlefield and the prize. Uh. AP has a question in light of the living plasma hypothesis. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the meaning of Colossians one, where it says in him, all things hold together. Oh, absolutely. I'm here's, here's the problem with the plasma life hypothesis. And, and the reason why I put uh, the church father front and center in the book that I did, because you would err tremendously. If you think of God in those terms, and what I mean by that is if you look at traditional Christian theology, not what passes for traditional Christian theology in modern evangelical America. N not or, churchianity. <laughs> or, or its detractors. Yeah. If you look at traditional theology, traditional theology tells you that the essence of God 
is absolutely undefinable and unintelligible. This means that any category that you bring to God, including spirituality, materiality, existence, non-existence, simply do not apply. Can't. Can't. This is why when you encounter in the church fathers language that they will tell you that we are speaking in symbols. Even the creed itself in the Greek is called the symbol of the faith. It's a roadmap. It's not the actual topography. So in him we live and move and have our being. What this means to traditional theology is that you cannot comprehend the universe without the logos and the logos is a person not an abstraction hmm. it's christ incarnate in whom we all live and move and have our being now what does that mean well you heard the uh expression the communio sanctorum the communion of the saints what does that mean how are you an individual with your own consciousness, your own personhood, your own memory, your own history? How are you an individual part of this thing called the body of Christ? Do you lose your individuality? No, you don't. So we're going back to this idea here that I mentioned with these pictures mm -hmm. that the the individual human brain, well, where is it now? Ah, I just had it. I just saw it, and now I can't. There it is. Yeah. There's your individual human brain and the neurons and synapses. And yet the cosmos is full of a much larger structure. So in other words, it's a both and, not an either or. You are part of something much bigger, but you don't lose your individuality. You don't lose your personhood. And that's what I think it means by living in whom you live and move and have your being. Take it note, collectivists. Yeah, take note, collectivists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, this, you know, this, this is my whole point. Christianity is not about the grand abstractions. You're told to love your neighbor, not mankind. Oh. Please note the difference. Ooh, because your neighbor, your neighbor is somebody you've got to be concerned about and do something about. Yeah. If you your neighbor hurting or uh, enjoying something yeah. that's that's where the rubber meets the road the grand abstractions are the are the purview of Marx yeah. so get rid of all that crap Martin Taylor asks is CERN a weapon to threaten or detonate the destroy the conscious plasma it could be because if you look at if you look at CERN, what's it playing around with? Well, it's playing around with a proton stream, mm -hmm. and that's a plasma. Because you're implying that okay, to create this stream, we've had to separate this from electrons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're playing around with stuff in a non-atomic state. Yeah. So yeah, is is could it be something designed to manipulate, possibly even detonate something? Yeah. And uh, to ever ask that question, I go back to what I said in, in my book, The Third Way. When CERN was fired up, there were people that were concerned that one of the things it might create was a quark gluon plasma. In other words, a kind of mini singularity. Uh, and they actually attempted to stop it from being started up because of that. So Doom Guy asks, uh, huh. are prayers, witchcraft, or black magic a way to communicate with these plasma, plasma, plasma entities? You know, like ah, Jack yeah. Parsons told the FBI essentially mm -hmm. that. Um, let's put it this way. In the book, I suggest, uh, and, and I, I wrote the book in such a way as to imply things. I don't come right out and spell out a lot of things because I want people really to think. But one of the things I'm suggesting in the book is that the practices of ceremonial magic, which incidentally, there's another reason I included this particular church father 
because he says very specifically that seals and sigils cannot contain these plasmas. They cannot contain these things. So in other words, what he's warning you is, yeah, you might be able to call up and conjure these things, but don't be surprised if it steps out of the circle. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's warning you about. So could they be ways to communicate? Well, let's put it this way. If you're dealing with an intelligent plasma, how do they communicate? Mm -hmm. They don't talk. They don't utter sounds. What would they do? Well, telepathically, how would you do that? They would read At, intention. Well, they could read intention, but how would you how would you communicate that intention? At some point, you have to symbolize it. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest is that the whole, and this goes way back to my uh, co uh, Cosmic War and Breakaway Civilizations book, where I suggest that crop circles are a kind of communication, symbolic communication. Because why? Well, sometimes you see little ball lightning plasmas creating these things. Mm -hmm. And why are they doing that? Some people think they're trying to communicate through a highly mathematical symbolic language. Well, yeah, this is what I think is going on. But would I would I suggest that you try and communicate with them through the practices of black magic or ceremony? No way. <laughs> no way. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You'll be overloading your system, so to you speak. You will be overload. You yes, precisely. You're exposing yourself to danger of a sort that would take an exorcist to get you out of. Ah, uh -huh. isn't that interesting? Uh huh. <laughs> uh, Telegraphic asks or says plasmas are more powerful than AI because AI runs on quantum chips, which runs on chips that use plasma. Yep. Is it are, is AI the perfect backdoor? Ah, uh, oh, telegraphic. Doff my hat. You know, Elon Musk has been warning about AI. And yes, ding, ding, ding. This, this is, I think, the danger with AI. Is it's not the AI itself that's going to manifest the intelligence. It's gating something. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. It's gate. Just, again, these are entities that are harmonic at their very core. So to summon them, what do you do? You reproduce a, a, an overtone of their fundamental geometry. Here, once again, we're dealing with, with a fundamental and an, a series of overtones. How do you get it? Well, you reproduce as much of the analogy of that thing that you're trying to summon. But again, I caution anybody that thinks they're going to summon this stuff or play with this stuff against doing this. Right. For one thing, if, if, if the science is literally that new, you don't know what you're playing around with yet. And if, if the warnings concerning ceremonial magic that are, you know, millennia old by now are warning you about the power of these things, why would you want to play around with that? <laughs> Yeah. You know, I want to sip my tea and enjoy my DVDs. <laughs> I don't want to summon a demon or an angel. Well, you know, some 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 people would answer, "Oh, because we can." Oh, because we can. Or, or let's see what happens. <laughs> well, you know, right. Nick Nick Redfern. It's interesting you mentioned this, Walter. Oh yes, I know what you're. I know where you're going, and I love it. Well, Nick Redfern wrote a whole book about this idea that you know the clowns in America got playing around with this stuff and then all of a sudden realized, oh, we can't control what we summoned here. <laughs> well, surprise, guys. We could have told you that. <laughs> read that book. Finally yeah, read that book. It's called, yeah, it's, yeah, read that book. But yeah, yeah, you know, read the Bible too, guys. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are warnings galore in that. <laughs> <laughs> Polymathing. Are these entities cyclical, eternal, or just very long-lived? Oh, excellent question. Ding, ding, ding. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the answer of traditional Christian theology because that's what I am. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not an atheist. I'm not an agnostic. I'm not Jewish or Muslim. So there we go. So that's where I'm coming from. But in traditional Christian theology, in the Middle Ages, in the West, the Western scholastics dealt with this problem. And they coined a term for angels, and the term was sempiternal. And what they meant by that was that angels, as creatures, have a point of origin. They begin to be, in other words. However, because of what they are, they are kind of transtemporal. So they begin to be, but once they begin to be, they don't move through time like us. They're just there. And in fact, the church father that I, I use in the book comes right out and says a very similar thing, that they, they see what is happening. Mm -hmm. Note what I just said. They see what is happening, and it's that which allows them to predict the future. So in other words, they exist in a kind of non-temporal, temporal existence that the Western scholastics called sempiternal. They begin to be, but once they begin to be, they never stop being. And because they are in this uh, trans-temporal existence, they don't move through time or experience time the way that you and I do such that the first use, listen carefully, the first use of their will establishes their habit of will for all time. Ah. Ah. So when the devil falls, he's locked in his habit of will. Or he her. remains <laughs> fallen. He or... remains fallen. She remains fallen, or she remains. Maybe. Yeah, we're talking about you know uh, uh, trans temporal trans here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Trans temporal yeah. trans. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, don't get that operation. <laughs> uh, Rada Kalsa asks, "Are I guess are these beings archons?" Yeah, they could be. Yeah, yeah. If you look at if you look at that literature, uh, I think what you're probably talking about is that Gnostic text. That's called the hypostasis of the archons. Uh, it's part of the um, Nag Hammadi library of, of texts, um, and and that's an interesting title, the hypostasis of the archons, because the term hypostasis is the same term that that the church fathers used for personhood. So the title of the text is is telling you two things. Uh, hypostasis also literally means the substance or reality, you know, if, if you look at the way it's used in the philosophers. So you're, you're at one and the same time saying the reality of the archons and the personhood of the archons. So, yeah, could, it, could they be talking about that? Yeah. Nostalgic asks, do you agree that quantum mechanics is the vehicle of magic? To a certain extent, yeah. Yeah, because what what... Let me let me flip the picture a bit. Nostal nostal uh, nostalgic. Um, if you if you look at at quantum mechanics a different way, if you look at uh, the whole edifice of of modern theoretical physics, I would say going all the way back to uh, Kepler to a certain extent. If you look at it that way, what you're really looking at is metaphysics with equations. In other words, all the old classical metaphysics are now getting to the point that you can manipulate that metaphysics with a with an algebra. Leibniz and his his Characteristica Universalis, his idea that that the ancients had a form of analysis that allowed them to perform a kind of calculation, and those are his words, but without numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think I think a lot of physics, including quantum mechanics, is just metaphysics with equations. Okay, uh, 
Chris Vahabi is asking something about UFO picks from, and it's cut off. So, Chris, if you could uh, um, finish that sentence uh, about the UFO picks from what, and we'll, we could try to answer that. Philip Blair asks, who is, who or what is the angel sometimes known as Metatron? Well, Metatron is, is the name of one of these archons or one of these demonic characters that appears in a lot of Gnostic texts. Uh, you will even find it in some versions, some uh, textual rever uh, versions of, of the book of Enoch. Um, you'll find it in, in the book of Jubilees. Uh, so it's all over the place. Um, it's one of the names that you encounter in the lore of angels and demons. Usually the name is associated with a demon, or, or in other words, with a fallen angel. In other words, like Lucifer or Samael or people like that. Okay. Jesus Thrice asks, <laughs> if plasmas are intelligent, what are stars really? Well, <laughs> isn't it interesting that the ancient Egyptian religion viewed stars as living creatures? Why? Why? Um, I suspect that there, if, if you're entertaining seriously the plasma life hypothesis, then you have to go on to maintain that not only are stars the source of, of life, you know, we're all star stuff, uh, but quite literally that, that they're the source of life because they're alive. Hmm. I have no problem with this. And by the way, folks, I'm not a pantheist. I'm not an animist. I'm simply taking these texts and ideas seriously. That doesn't mean, like the Pharaoh Akhenaten, that I think our local son here is a god. Well, it's a god in that kind of, of pantheon, but it's not the god. Brian Evans has a comment. I have stood in the center and felt somewhere, something crop circle. Uh, Brian, restate that, and we'll, we, we can address that. Um, Martin Taylor says asks, uh, as Tesla said, lightning is a symphony of the heavens. Is harmonics implied? Oh, absolutely. What's lightning? It's a plasma. <laughs> it's, it's simply a plasma seeking to connect a circuit. That's all it is. Um, right. You know, so is it a harmonic, a harmonic thing? Absolutely it is. Great, great. Well, hey, that's, uh, that's all the questions that, um, we have um joseph this has been another <clears throat> fantastic discussion yeah an episode this is the, wow this is a big one and uh, a lot of people are gonna you know uh, be bummed that they miss the live but uh tell everyone where they can get your book the demon in the echo uh the book is up on my website just go to the tab that says books and you'll see the <clears throat> cover and click on the cover it will take you directly to adventures unlimited where they can where they can order the book i'm um uh, i'm done sending people to amazon <laughs> so anyway uh buy the book directly from the publisher <laughs> yes yeah whenever you can whenever you yeah, can whenever you buy can. it directly from the publisher if you can because um you know amazon takes overwhelmingly the lion's share um of the the the, the um royalty in, in oh dear walter somebody in the chat room says that i need to testify to congress no <laughs> <laughs> no no <laughs> uh, that will no uh, uh you, you don't want those guys knowing you exist i right? have an aversion to swamps and the creatures that dwell <laughs> in them the there last listen the last to, to native virginian the last time i was in washington dc was uh, the early 1990s, and I have to tell you, I could not stand it there because the spiritual oppression and evil of the place just absolutely nauseated me. And I, I was there with a friend, and we beat a hasty retreat. We there we both go. felt it. I, no way, no way. Well, uh, I'll I, ask I, you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish. Oh, I pr I pray for the place, but people won't like how I pray for the place. <laughs> I was just going to throw one last brief question 
before we uh, sure. let you go. And uh, thinking back to what we've been talking about tonight um, and and thinking, uh, going back to the discussion of when did UFOs appear, the uh, UFOs appearing over Washington, D.C. in 1952, possibly oh. plasma as opposed to craft? Possibly, yes, because the other odd thing about plasmas is if you if you view some UFOs as plasmas, which some of them appear to be, is yes. that they can and sometimes do not appear on radar. Once again, another mystery or unanswered question answered or explained, you know. Um, well, yeah, if, if they're electromagnetic <clears throat> in nature, can they cause a return? Well, what is radar? And, and people have to really latch on to what I'm saying here. Radar is not a bounce. It's not a reflection. When you send out a radio wave to an object, like an airplane, and you get a return, that return is actually a, an electrical current that the radio wave is stimulating in the airplane. And it's that current, in turn, which is broadcasting the radio wave, and it's that which you're picking up. So in other words, all radar, please, for stealth plane fans, hear me now. All radar is a secondary transmitter effect. There is no such thing as any geometric shape that can give you radar stealthiness. All you have to know is the resonant frequency. Now, that also means that you can damp any radar by being 180 degrees out of phase with it. So could a plasma do that? You betcha. Hmm. Could a plasma therefore send a radar return? You betcha. All of the above. <laughs> there you go. There, you, there go. you go. Well, Joseph, thank you again very much for uh, coming on and, and having this discussion. I look forward to doing More this again enough. next month. And um, I look forward to getting your book and diving right into it. Oh, I'm sure that we're, <laughs> we're going to be right back here <laughs> talking yeah. about all this stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Time. Well, uh, again, thank you, and you have a good night, and we'll be talking with you soon. You do the same, Walter. Thanks right, for having thank me you. back. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, folks. Um, wow. Uh, another another mind-blowing episode with uh, Joseph Farrell talking about transtemporal cosmic war and its implications, and we will continue this discussion in the weeks ahead. Um, it, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's just beyond fascinating, really. So I want to thank everybody in the live stream. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the live chat room. Um, your questions are great. Uh, yeah, fantastic turnout. I hope you're enjoying the new time that we're doing this. I know I am because we're opening it up to more people being able to participate in the live uh, stream here, the live show. Don't forget to go to walterbosley.com to get your pre-order copy of my upcoming book, NIMSA, How America Sold Its Soul. And also check out the NIMSACon, the upcoming event in uh, Sonora, California, in, in the Sonora Aero Club mystery region in Northern California, next to Yosemite, um, October 13th through the 15th. Joseph Farrell will be one of the speakers. He'll be streamed in. You'll see him live on the big screen. But there will be live speakers there. Uh, Seshari, Olaf Phillips, myself. And uh, we're working on uh, another one. And uh, there's going to be some interesting guest people already planning on being there. And um, check it out at walterbosley.com. And I thank you all for being here. We had a great turnout tonight, today. Um, and... Uh, I'll see you next time around. We have Tim Benal next Wednesday at this time. And uh, who knows who else and what else in between. So you guys have a good night and we'll see you next time.